spin. Rumpelstiltskin retold. A Tale in the Romance, a medieval fairy tale series. Written by Demelza Carlton. Auto narrated by AI Charlotte from Google. 1. Kempenich winced as he reined in his horse. Even that slight movement set off the pain in his chest. Truth be told, he should not be riding at all, and he knew it. But some things could not wait. The destrier's hooves caught on something, but the horse righted himself before Kempenich was thrown from the saddle. He breathed a sigh of relief. Darkness had carried him into many battles at the order of King Karl the Great, while the monarch had lived. Now he'd outlived his king, the time had come for what might be his last battle, and he intended to ride the black beast home from this one. He slid down to the ground. I seek the witch, he bellowed. It took every bit of his strength to stand tall and stride toward the cottage, as a knight should. The witch emerged, her arms folded across her chest. There was pity in her dark eyes, but she stood firm. I am sorry Sir Rumpelstiltskin, but there is nothing more I can do for you. You're dying. Mistress Kuhn turned away. Sir Kempenich von Rumpelstiltskin refused to admit defeat. I may be dying, but there is still something you can do for me. She sighed. I assure you there is not, but why don't we go inside and discuss it? I can see you need a pain draft. That, at least, I can give you. Kempenich followed her inside the cottage, then sank gratefully onto a bench. He would drink anything she asked, if only she would grant him one last favor. Mistress Kuhn darted about the cottage, assembling what she needed to make the draft, and Kempenich summoned his resolve. Once more into battle, dot not for his life, but for the future. Mistress, I have heard tales that you are more than a herb wife and healer. More than a usual witch. There are tales that you are what heathens call an enchantress, a woman who works magic. They say that you have power over earth and rocks, and when a child from the village fell down a well, you cracked open the very earth itself to retrieve her, then commanded the rock to return to its previous place, and it obeyed. Kempenich held his breath, praying she would confirm the story. Kuhn glanced at him. There are all sorts of tales. Why, I have heard people tell stories of unicorns and dragons and immortality to children around the fire at night. Kempenich bowed his head. He too had told such tales to his children. Including one he hoped was more fact than fiction. There is a story about an ancient king who was granted a wish. He wanted to be the richest man in the world, so he wished for everything he touched to turn to gold. It is said that gold comes from the ground, and a wielder of earth magic might be able to do such a thing. Kuhn lifted a bucket of water and poured some of it into a small pot over the fire. Then you must also know the end of the king's tale. He could not eat or drink or touch his family and he feared his wish would kill him, so he washed his wish away in the river and shunned gold for the rest of his days. I will soon be beyond such mundane things as gold or food or even days mistress. But my family will not. And I have spent all that I have in physic for what ails me, seeking a cure that will let me live long enough to restore my family's fortune. If I die now, I will leave them little more than the Rumpelstiltskin house on stilts my father left me, on the rock King Karl granted him for his service. Other knights are building castles along the river to secure their lands, and if my son does not have one, he will lose his lands to a richer man who does. He needs gold, and I would give anything to give it to him. Kuhn sank onto a bench and squinted at him in the dim light. You ask me to curse you. Not for yourself, but for your son, who you will never be able to touch again. You will never be able to eat or drink, and your own wife will not be able to hold your hand as you take your dying breath. You even wish to hasten that dying breath. Yes. I am no use to them like this. Better to be dead than to be a burden. Kempenich took the cup she offered and drained it. Silence stretched between them. But it was Mistress Kuhn who broke it. There is some truth in the tale, but the enchanter who cast such a spell was a fool. 
I can restrict the spell to your hands while you live. You may still eat and drink, as long as your hands do not touch it. But when your heart stops the spell will spread throughout your body, turning it all to gold. Kun bowed her head. This I will do for you, but you must swear to tell no one about the source of your wealth. Breathe a word to anyone that I cast the spell, and that breath shall be your last. I swear on my honor and that of my father that I shall tell no one, Kempenich promised. Then hold out your hands palms up, Kuhn instructed, picking up a knife. She pricked her thumb with the point, then used the welling blood to trace lines on Kempenich's fingers, then his hands, until she swiped her thumb along the lines on Kempenich's wrists, right the way around. By my blood, I bespell yours. Everything your hands touch from this moment until the day you die, will turn to gold. For a moment, Kempenik's hands glowed, then lit up in a blinding flash of blue that made him turn his head away, lest the brightness hurt his eyes. When he saw his hands again, the light had vanished, and so had the blood, though the blue tinge to his fingertips had taken on a greenish hue. Dead hands. Kempenich shivered. Did he dare touch anything with them? What if the spell hadn't worked, and he tainted whatever he touched instead? I would offer you a cup of wine to toast your family's fortunes, but... Kempenich grimaced. No more wine for me now? It does not agree with the draft you gave me. Kuhn nodded. I have just the thing. One of the dairymaids brought a pail of milk this morning, and it's been chilling in the cellar ever since. I mean to keep the cream for butter, but there will be more tomorrow. She rose and headed for the cellar. When she returned, she carried a brimming jug that she poured into two cups and a bowl. When she caught Kempenich eyeing the bowl with curiosity, she shrugged. That's for butter. He usually comes running as soon as I go into the cellar, for he loves his milk. She raised her voice and called butter. Puss puss puss. But the cat did not come. With increasing urgency, the witch kept calling, leaving Kempenich alone in the cottage as she moved outside. After a while Kuhn fell silent. But she didn't come back in. Kempenich debated whether to follow her, or stay and wait. He wanted to head home before the effects of Kuhn's draft wore off, but even the walk to where he'd tethered darkness wore him out these days. He knew in his bones this would be his last ride. You did this. Kuhn shrieked, bursting into the cottage. In her arms, she cradled a piece of gold-colored fur. It took a moment for Kempenich to realize the fur was still attached to a feline body. I've never seen that cat before, he said weakly. It wasn't a lie. Too late, he remembered his horse stumbling as he arrived at the cottage. Had Darkness lost his footing because he trod on the cat? Kuhn pointed a shaking hand at Darkness. He had a muddy hoof print on his back that could only have come from that enormous warhorse of yours. You come here for my help, yet you kill my cat without a care? It's not my fault your ailment is beyond my powers. You, Sir Kempenich von Rumpelstiltskin, have no heart, and that is what is killing you. Take your golden curse but know this, every male born of your blood will bear the same curse. His heart will fail him in his prime just as yours has, and his only warning will be the curse, heralding his death. And you, she waved her hand, and Kempenich found himself soaring through the air to land in the saddle. You shall have a daily reminder of the creature you killed. Another wave of her hand, and a pair of gloves appeared on Kempenich's hands. Golden brown leather, lined with golden fur. Kempenich glanced at her, only to find the cat's corpse had vanished. He now wore it on his hands. His belly roiled, but he fought to keep the billa down. But Kuhn wasn't finished. As long as you wear these gloves, you may touch things like a normal man. Take them off and all you touch turns to gold. A curse on you and all who follow you. Please. Curse me, kill me, do what you will with me, but don't hurt my son, he begged. Her eyes were the cold of black ice. Bring my cat back to life, and I will consider it. Please? She clapped her hands. Go. The tether holding darkness broke and he galloped off, 
forcing Kempenich to cling desperately to the reins so that he would not fall off. And don't return, she shouted after him. As his world dissolved into despair, Kempenich knew one thing for certain, he would never return to the witch's cottage. For if he survived the ride home, it would be a miracle indeed. He remembered little, until something in the horse's slowing gait made him open his eyes. After several blinks, the blue-green blur before him revealed itself to be the corroded bronze lion that protected the bridge to the island where the house of Rumpelstiltskin stood. Without thinking, he pulled off his glove and patted the lion's head, as he had done every time he returned home safely. This time his fingers tingled at the touch, and too late he realized what he'd done. The bluish bronze was neither blue nor bronze anymore but bright shining gold. He shoved his hand back into the cat fur glove, cursing witches and their cats. His son would die young, and so would his grandsons, because Kempenich had been a thoughtless fool who sought out a witch. He should have left things well enough alone. But it was too late now. What had he done? And how would he ever set it right? As his vision faded and Kempenich slid from his horse to the ground, fighting for air that did not seem to breathe life into him anymore, he had one last fleeting thought. Even if he died before he could restore his family's fortune, at least his son would have a chance to do it. Before this curse killed him too. 2. And so the wheel turns. The flax would flower and fade, the ponds would fill and flow, and through it all Molina would spin and spin and spin, for how else could a woman help the prosperity of her flood-ravaged town? She stared wistfully at the water wheels, which never stopped as long as the water flowed down from the mountains. If Lord Barkmire would only listen to her and let more such wheels be built, their town would be prosperous once more. His grandfather had listened to her grandmother, otherwise these wheels would not be here at all, but to hear the current Lord Barkmire talk, it was as though nothing had changed since his many times great-grandfather had been given this land from King Carl the Great himself. If half the stories she'd heard of King Carl, or Charlemagne as the current king called him, were true, he'd have built new wheels all over his empire before the year was out, harnessing the flood instead of complaining about it. At least Lord Barkmire had agreed to plant flax in the flood-ravaged fields as soon as the water went down. Which meant an ocean of blue flowers instead of other crops, but they could trade linen for food. Heaven's new precious little grain had passed through the mill this year, but that was just as well, for they needed the spare water wheels to power the hammers to beat the flax. That had been her mother's design, but Molina had improved on it since. What Lord Barkmire didn't know wouldn't hurt him. Molina sighed. She could speed up some of the process, but spinning the flax still took the most time. If she could use a wheel to turn the spindle, this would be so much faster. Good day, Miss Molina, a male voice said. She glanced up in time to see Hofer slap Lanik before Lanik remembered to snatch his cap off his head. Good day, boys. How goes the spring planting? Almost done, Miss but it looks like the flax on the northern slopes is almost ready to harvest, maybe as early as next week, so we might have to bring the flax up to the pools to soak, and my father sent us to make sure there is water enough up there in the millponds, Hofer said. The pools are full, with enough water coming down the mountain to keep the wheels turning, Molina replied. Lanik coughed. Big pardon miss, but uncle wanted us to speak to Mr. Raidmaker. Of course he did. None of the men in town would take the word of a mere woman over the miller, even if she was his daughter. Molina forced a smile. Father is beekeeping today. He had his eye on some wild hives further up the mountain, and he thinks they will swarm soon. He means to capture some new queens for our hives. Their hives were the only ones that had survived the flooding, so if father didn't capture new bees, there would be no mead brood in the town at all this year. I'm sure he'd appreciate the help of two big strong lads. Maybe even look the other way if a boy managed to get his hands on a honeycomb of his own. Yes miss. Thank you miss. The boys scampered off, too eager at the thought of the possible sweet treat awaiting them to even say farewell. Boys indeed. They were the same age as she was, old enough to marry, 
but she'd never see them as anything but the boys she'd grown up with. Certainly not potential husbands, though the other girls in the village didn't seem to share her opinions. Most of them were married already. At this rate she wouldn't marry anyone, and today would be the same as every day for the rest of her life. She would sit and spin and watch the water wheels, waiting for her father to return home for the evening meal, wishing for something different. Today she could do something different. She'd done enough spinning for one day, and the warm breeze whispered of the summer waiting just over the horizon. Perhaps she should go check on the pools herself, and have a swim while she was up there. If the pools would be full of flax next week, this might be her only chance. She set her spinning inside and dug out a cloth she could use to dry herself afterwards. Flinging it over her shoulder, she set off up the mountain, following the stream to the source of all its bubbling secrets. 3. Lubos had changed his mind he decided. Marriage was indeed the happiest state in the world, for if he were at home with his chosen wife, he would not be here in this predicament. He almost wished he'd simply closed his eyes and agreed to the first girl his father thrust toward him as a possible bride. Instead, he had to endure the company of what felt like hundreds of girls exactly the same as the first. Oh they might look different, with blonde hair or brown or even a red head or two, but whatever color their eyes had been he had not noticed. For every girl's eyes held the same look, wide and on the verge of tears. For each girl had been little more than the object of their father's ambition. He wanted her to marry the prince, therefore she was dangled in front of a prince, and it was her duty to ensnare said prince, or forever dishonor her whole family. He did not want to be a duty. He wanted a wife who wanted him, not merely a crown. Yet it seemed once women knew he was the crown prince, the crown part was all they saw. Lubos had had his fill of such girls at court, which was why he'd happily agreed to his father's suggestion that he accompany the tithe collectors on their rounds this year. Father had told him he suspected a conspiracy among his lords and barons, who were cheating him of his rightful percentage. Lubos, however, smelled a different plot. The recent floods had affected them all, and all of his father's kingdom was poorer because of it. If the tithe was smaller this year, it was because the lords and barons had less to give. Well, to the king perhaps. Every man among them with a daughter old enough to be out of swaddling clothes wanted to push the poor girl toward the prince, and it was worse than court. Lord Barkmire was by no means the worst of them, but Lubos had to give him credit for being the most persistent. His four daughters were all old enough to be married, and it seemed the girls had a competition among themselves to see who could win the prince. Lord Barkmire had boasted about the quality and quantity of linen his lands produced, and it seemed that every lady in the land was employed in making the stuff. His own daughters went everywhere with a spindle in one hand and a distaff in the other, linked by a length of thread. This thread they then used to ensnare him in any way they could. Why, only last night, Lubos had woken from a terrible nightmare. The four girls had turned into spiders, venom dripping from their fangs, as they spun webs to entrap him the moment he moved. Unable to bear the feeling of fine wool or linen, for it reminded him of his nightmare, in the morning he dressed in his coarsest clothes. But he'd almost screamed when Lorelei let her hair trail over his hand as she filled his cup. To escape her wide eyes and even wider mouth, for Lorelei had evidently never heard a man utter such an unmanly squeak before, he'd made his excuses and bolted. He headed to the town at first, a place where the girls did not go, for they believed it was beneath them, or at least their father did. But as he descended into the valley, Lubos noticed a stream with a well-worn path beside it, that led up the mountain and into the forest. There might be good hunting up here, he thought, which would give him a good excuse to flee from Lord Barkmire and his daughters in the future, if he needed it. As he climbed, Lubos heard a strange creaking sound. Like a sign blown in the wind, but it was not a back-and-forth sound. It was as though the wind had picked up the sign and carried it forward, protesting all the way as it moved ever onward. Lubos laughed aloud at the thought. Why the sign was him, moving ever onward from vassal to vassal, protesting when presented with a possible bride at each new castle. 
Lubos emerged from the shelter of the trees and saw the truth. The creaking was driven by water, not wind. Nor did the wood move onward. The giant water wheels, spinning on their axles in the stream's turbulent flow, could go nowhere. They were anchored in this place, as marriage would make him a fixture in his father's castle, for the rest of his life. A small bridge arced over the millstream, leading to a building as big as any manor house Lubos had visited on his travels. This belonged to the miller, or at least it did now. Perhaps Lord Barkmire's family had once lived here before moving to their current castle. He considered crossing the bridge so that he might take a closer look at the house, and perhaps obtain a cup of ale, for climbing this path had been thirsty work. But if this house belonged to Lord Barkmire still, then any of his daughters might be lying in wait for him there, or one of his servants who might send a runner to find the girls. Either way, his solitary walk would be over. Instead, Lubos dropped to his knees beside the stream, cupped his hands and drank. It was cold and sweet, tasting of the mountains it had descended from. Better yet, it slaked his thirst enough to make him choose a higher path, the one that led further up the mountain, following the stream. For if the water tasted so good in the lower reaches down here, how much purer would it be in heights? Determined now, he followed the stream to its source. 4. Molina trekked up to the pools, panting a little as the slope grew steeper. The track led to the topmost pool, the biggest and deepest of the three. The cool blue water tempted most newcomers into taking a dip, but Molina knew better. The glacier-fed stream was ice-cold still when it fed the top pool, and the overhanging trees did little to let the sun in to warm the water. The second pool was little better, for it was cut into the cold stone of the mountain itself, which seemed to drink the warmth the water gained from the sun glittering across its surface. The third pool, however, was an overflow for the other two. When the snow melt was too much for the top two pools to take, the water trickled down over the rocks into what was now a third pool, but after midsummer would be little more than a depression in the ground, where the softest, thickest grass grew. Now it was waist deep, perfect. No trees grew around this pool. The rocks left them no place to take root. Molina clambered down to the bottom pool before she stripped off, laying her clothes out on the rocks. She was under no illusions that the water would be warm, and she would appreciate her sun-warmed clothes when she donned them again. She stretched her towel out on the biggest, flattest rock, where it would be within easy reach. From up here, you could see almost clear to the other side of the valley and all the town in between. If anyone approached, she would spot them at least a mile away as they took the road leading out of town, more than enough time to dry off and dress. So she plunged into the water, hissing at that first cold contact, before she grew used to the temperature and began to wash. She used the soap on her body first, lathering and rinsing as she surveyed the valley below. Then, checking that she could still feel her feet, she decided to take advantage of the afternoon sun to wash and dry her hair too. Unbinding it took some time and washing it even longer, for the thick dark mane was her only vanity, not that anyone noticed. Most of the other girls in the village had hair in varying shades of flax. The darkness that made her different didn't appeal to any of the village boys. Not that she wanted it to, Molina reminded herself. When she was satisfied that her hair was hidden under the thick layer of creamy lather, she lay back floating on the surface of the water as she rinsed the soap from her hair. She combed her fingers through it again and again, sending bubbles over the lip of the little waterfall which in turn fed the stream that turned her father's water wheels. She squinted at the turning wheels which looked like toys from this distance. If she could only attach a spindle to the axle of one and yet keep the distaff close enough. Molina shook her head and ducked under the water. Under the surface the world was murky and green, much like the strange ideas that wanted to take shape in her head. Water mills for spinning and weaving. Why even Lord Barkmire thought her daft, having such ideas? Perhaps he was right. No, she was not daft, she told herself firmly, surging out of the water. Her father listened to her, just as he had listened to her mother. Her ideas were new and different, much like mother's, and the town did not like different. The floods had proved that. 
The floodwaters might have washed away crops and buildings, but it seemed the swirling waters had taken some people's sanity with it too. Once things settled down again, perhaps then they would be open to new ideas. Lord Barkmire could not live forever. She used her towel to dry herself off as best she could, and squeezed the water from her hair. She pulled on a shift to cover her nakedness, then began to comb her hair. When the tangles were gone, she stretched out on the rock where her towel had lay, letting the sun dry her hair, before she braided it back into a style more suitable for a virtuous miller's daughter. Resting her head in her hand, once again she watched the water wheels turning, the cogs of her mind turning with them. A spindle, a distaff, and a wheel, dot all placed together so that she had no need to hold them, leaving her hands free to spin and spin faster. She found a fire pit, long since extinguished, where the farmhands heated up their dinner on flax harvest days, and dug out some charcoal. A piece of bark, caught between two rocks on the edge of the pool, sufficed as her canvas, and Molina began to draw the design taking shape in her head.